So welcome to New Freedom. Welcome to Position in Neutrality. Merry Christmas to everybody. Um, is there anybody in here for the first time tonight? Never been to this group? Very good. First of all, welcome to you. And second, let me warn you in advance, you're liable to experience us just a little different than other meetings of other fellowships you may have attended. The primary reason that's liable to happen is that we intend for you to have a very different experience here. What we do is we take a look at the suggested instruction for a step or so a week directly out of this book, and we use this book in 12-step recovery. Why? The process described by the authors of this book has been proven to work for addicts of the hopeless variety, addicts to alcohol and other substances. So what I attempt to do is show you how I find my experience in the book and encourage you to have your experience with the book. And if we both do our job, we'll share a spiritual experience in here tonight. Right. Fair enough? How many of you have been here before and can witness that happens? So those of you online, you can't see it because of anonymity and such, but they're raising their hand to tell you that in 12-step recovery, when we speak of a spiritual experience, we're talking about a sensory experience. You will feel it. And when you do, I'll know. And I'll call it to your attention, because we would cheat you to talk to you about the power we call God without giving you a demonstration of the power. Fair enough? So tonight, we're going to take a look at step 12, where it's having awakened, right? You ready? Good deal. So what is the goal of 12-step recovery? The goal of 12-step recovery is to wake up so we can give back what was so freely given to us. Exactly right. So a lot of people think the goal of 12-step recovery is abstinence because that's what the fellowship celebrates. But abstinence is a byproduct of waking up spiritually. Make sense? It's not even abstinence. It's just a new sense of ease and comfort. We find our power within us. We don't have to go out in the world looking for our ease and comfort anymore. Fair enough? It's a handy little trick for addicts to know. All right, so we're in step 12 tonight. Those of you that are members here and family members, um, they're going to do a, instead of the Saturday service, Chaplain Lee and uh, Pastor Nate from Prison Fellowship International and a live band tomorrow night, they're going to do a midnight service here. Any of you that want to come celebrate with our members, you're welcome to come. They're going to open the doors at 11.15. The live band's going to start at 11.30. They're going to do a service and what have you at midnight. And then we're going to go to bed before Santa comes. <laughs> so, all right. So we're in chapter 7 tonight. And we're looking at the 12th step. And it starts out with some promises and conditions. And I like for people to sort of identify the promises and conditions if they can and see how these authors tell the story. This is their testimony, not our testimony. Not anyone living in the fellowship today's testimony. This is theirs. If I align it with theirs, then I'm likely to get the same experience they got. Yes? Rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. They didn't say paths. They said path. Okay. All right. So practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. Did you find some promises there? What did you find? Like they're spoiling the whole story. That's a, that's a bummer, right? So intensive work with alcoholics works when other activities fail. So they promise the other activities. So what are the other activities? 90 and 90. Everything you hear in the modern fellowship are other activities short of the disciplines we learn and we're not panning what people have suggested. They're just not the program. Does it make sense? Yep. So what they said is when I'm serving actively, intensively, that ensures immunity. I get more power than I need when I offer it to another. Does that make sense? Okay. So then it goes on to say this is our 12th suggestion, colon. So a lot of people take it to mean that the 12th suggestion was Practical experience shows that nothing so much ensures immunity as intensive work, but that's not the 12th suggestion. It has to follow, because in the English language, the colon means the suggestion follows. So the selfish reason I do it is I would like immunity. 
but the selfless reason, which is what happens through me, but not of me, follows. Does that make sense? And they say, carry this message to other alcoholics. How does one carry a message? How many of you have discovered you have a changed nature? How many of you didn't really intend to have a changed nature specifically? It just, it just happens, right? They told us that in 11th step, right? Okay, so we carry the message because the light does not need an announcement. Does that make sense? When I turn on the light in here, it's self-evident. When the light comes on in you, it's self-evident. And people will ask you, my goodness, you're different. You're, you're all lit up. Okay, well, I got God. He sees to it. I'm all lit up. Honor your third step, right? Okay. You can help when no one else can. Why? Because I have experience. I've been tediously prepared and protected through active addiction and all the craziness that that implied so that I could bear witness to you that the grace that restored me has sent me to you. Right? And we, we know suffering like few do. Do we not? So you can secure their confidence when others fail. Why? Because they'll listen to you because you have experience. Because we're peers. How many of you are New Freedom members? We're peer led. Why? Because you'll listen to somebody who knows your experience, right? Not sharing their opinion, sharing their experience. Okay, you can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember they're very ill. Life will take on new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends, this is an experience you must not miss. Why did they use the word experience instead of sight, do you imagine? These guys were very intentional. They used the words they meant. They meant the words they said. They agreed on every word with a thesaurus and a dictionary. Why did they not say, they talked about all these things they saw growing up about them, but they described it as an experience, not a sight. Why? Because you feel it. You got, you got, you're picking up what Sean's putting down? How many of you have been able to feel that you were in the presence of somebody who was in the presence? Okay, because that's that vital sixth sense they kept talking to us about. God consciousness, yes? Okay. All right, so then it says, says that the frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. Perhaps you're not acquainted with any drinkers who want to recover. Perhaps. How many of you find that hard to believe? How many of you have found people who don't want to recover in places you thought it was odd for them to congregate. Like AA meetings. <laughs> There's always been an argument in the fellowships about whether we recover or we're always recovering. And it's not an argument, it's a misunderstanding on the part of the people. This book was written before there was a medical diagnosis for alcoholism and addiction. So they weren't talking about a medical recovery. They were talking about a redemption. It's a mining term, not a medical term. They say the word recovered 17 times in the, in the text, and they only say recovering twice, and that's in the chapter to the wife about the still drinking alcoholic. But how many of you have found that your life has been reclaimed and repurposed, and you're now living out a useful existence as a result of, okay, then you're recovered. That make sense? Okay. So then it says, you can easily find some by asking a few doctors, ministers, priests, or hospitals. They'll be only too glad to assist you. Don't start out as an evangelist or reformer. What's that look like? Hallelujah, brothers. <laughs> <laughs> some people think it looks like me, too. Yeah. But we're, we're a passive evangelical crowd in 12-step recovery. I don't need for you to believe what I believe. I need you to know that I believe what I believe. So I challenge you to follow me and I'll show you what I believe. Okay? All right. So unfortunately, a lot of prejudice exists. You'll be handicapped if you arouse it. Ministers and doctors are competent and you can learn much from them if you wish. But it happens that because of your own drinking experience, you can be uniquely useful to other alcoholics. Notice the words they use. They didn't say your drinking experience made you uniquely useful. They said, because of your drinking experience, 
properly armed with the facts about yourself, which they told you in one, you can be uniquely useful. But it isn't about trying to out-war story anybody, because drunk's drunk. But when I tell you what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now, I talk to you about an insane man. I got letters from psychiatrists that said this man was emotionally and mentally incapable of conducting any personal business for 18 months. A letter to the DMV, Sean Kendall saw it. Yet I stand before you today, the chief executive officer of this place. All, all glory to God. Make, make no mistake. So, so, so cooperate, never criticize, to be helpful is our only aim. When you discover a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous, find out all you can about them. How do we do that? Yeah, we got to ask them and then we got to listen, right? It says that it does, if he does not want to stop drinking, don't waste time trying to persuade him. You may spoil a later opportunity. Who's the persuader? Alcohol. Alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, fentanyl, very persuasive forces. We can't compete with that. Okay? They should be patient, realizing they're dealing with a sick person. If there's any indication that he wants to stop, have a good talk with the person most interested in him, usually his wife. Get an idea of his behavior, his problems, his background, the seriousness of his condition, and his religious leanings. You need this information to put yourself in his place to see how you'd like him to approach you if the tables were turned. So how many of you have been blessed with a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps? Working with others. Let's be honest. How many of you take the time to pray and meditate first, get the information from them, and see how you'd like to be approached if the roles were reversed? Because sometimes we go in a little ham-handed. I do. And then I realize, wow, that was ineffective. God, could you give me my effectiveness back? And he says, Joe, it was never your effectiveness. It was my effectiveness. And if you'd wake the fuck up, we could get to work. <laughs> Any of you ever had a conversation like that with? Okay. All right. So I'm going to jump over to page 91, because most of us initially will meet him in the fellowships of recovery. And I'm in the middle of that page. It says, see your man alone if possible. So how many of you that are working with people know how difficult that can be? Get in the car. <laughs> Sean kidnaps him. What, <laughs> what is your experience normally when you walk into a room and someone announces themselves as the new person? <laughs> Got a sponsor yet? Here, read the first 164 page. Call me. <laughs> Guys, uh, yeah? We got, I just came in to use the bathroom, I, actually. So how do you see the man alone, if possible? There you go. So we're, we're sharing ideas with everybody. The, the people that are doing this actively, we try and get them apart so we can just have some one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, meeting before the meeting, meeting after the meeting, whatever. Okay. At first, engage in general conversation. What's that look like? I haven't seen you here before. Did you catch the game last night? Again, what are they usually here? <laughs> anyway, after a while, turn the talk to some phase of drinking. Tell him enough about your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. Are you properly armed with the facts about yourself so that you can discuss your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences without speaking in Alcoholics Anonymous? Yes. Because yes. a lot of times our language is, goes before us. Any of you ever been out? Like you were in, and then you were out, and then an AA approached you, and you knew by what they said, oh shit, an AA. <laughs> so when we're properly armed with the facts about ourselves, we talk about this abnormal reaction we have to chemicals that's different from other people. I, f I found that the, the chemical alcohol, when I put it in my body, did not sedate me, it energized me. I drank it like some people did coffee to stay awake on a long drive. Yes. That's an abnormal reaction. The doctor opined that that might be an allergic reaction. So it's not a joke, this allergy. I really do have this abnormal reaction that is observable in me. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So if he wishes to talk, let him do so. You'll thus get a better idea how you ought to proceed. If he's not communicative, give him a sketch of your drinking career up to the time you quit, but say nothing for the moment of how that was accomplished. Why not? I want to I want to talk to us about talking above our pay grade. How many of you know how your sobriety was accomplished? No. To a person we have no clue, right? We're not qualified to talk on how that was accomplished. I can talk to you all about who accomplished it. But they're not ready to hear that. They want to hear about some method. I don't pick up no matter what. That's a fucking lie. I pick up no matter what. And then one day I don't, right? Okay. So if he's in a serious mood, dwell on the troubles liquor has caused you, being careful not to moralize their lecture. So what's that look like? I don't want to talk. That's right, JJ. I want to talk to him, not at him. And I don't want to talk about myself in disparaging terms because when I'm the new guy and someone's saying, I was a piece of shit and I was a horse thief and a liar, which I heard a lot, and I know they didn't mean any harm, but the way I interpreted that was, you mean like me? And I was already so deep in condemnation, I didn't need any more. And, and what I know as a result of these steps, properly armed with the facts about myself, at my worst and at my best, I was a child of the living God. And if my preparation was disturbing to you, it's always disturbing, it was disturbing to me too. But look at the preparation has brought forth, right? All right, so, so if his mood is light, tell him humorous stories of your escapades and get him to tell some of his. So how many of you got humorous stories of your escapades? All of us, right? We may not want to tell them, but if it was all not fun, we wouldn't have stayed out there so damn long. How many of you got here and there wasn't nothing funny? I was that guy. So I got to be sensitive to guys like me because if you come in trying to be funny, there ain't nothing funny. Right? Okay, and then it says, when you see, he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic. Why would I describe myself as an alcoholic? Because I, I know myself to be, and an alcoholic of my variety is, would either be dead or redeemed. Because no other, they, the thing about, a lot of people think you name yourself an alcoholic at the podium to say if some present condition is simply not true. In the same way Matthew witnesses to being a tax collector and an apostle of Christ, I want you to know the deplorable condition from which I've been restored and sent to you. So I will tell you, I'm an alcoholic recovered, and I'm here to introduce you to the one who does the recovery. Okay. Make sense? Okay. All right, so give him an account of the struggles you made to stop. How many of you made struggles? We, we can write books on the struggles, right? Okay. Show him the mental twist which leads to the first drink of a spree. Have you guys identified that twist? How many of you have found there's lots of them? How many of you had some clean time, then you went to work, kind of a rough week, working with some people. They said, hey man, we're gonna go out after work. We're just gonna pop off a little bit chill out, tough week. Sat there by yourself thinking, I had a tough week. <laughs> Why can't I go just chill out? Yeah. Any of you do, do that? I did that. What happened to you? All those people went home, I went and lived under a bush. That's why I can't do it. Because I have a different reaction than other people. Anyone else? Am I in a room full of kindred spirits? <laughs> we suggest you have done this as, we, as we've done it in the chapter on alcoholism. So chapter 3, they talk about more about alcoholism. They go into the story of Jim and Fred and the jaywalker. You guys re relate to the jaywalker? Okay. You guys get the whole story of Jim, the car guy? Okay, I'm not going to go into it tonight. We've done that before. Okay, so, no, I got to. I have to. I was going to go buy it. So Jim didn't start drinking until later in life. And he owned a dealership, which he lost because of his drinking. And then he found himself having to go to work 
for the dealership he once owned. Have any of you ever had to take a sort of marginalized job as a result of your addiction? How'd that make you feel? Well, Jim said on his way to work, he felt a little agitated, but nothing serious. And when he got to work, he had a few words with the boss. So any of you ever got to work feeling a little agitated, had a few words with the boss? <laughs> That's what happened to Jim. And then after that little kerfuffle, Jim decides that while he's at the dealership where people come to buy cars, he's going to go out in the woods looking for people to buy cars. You know, because the people that don't come to dealerships hang out in these woods. So on his way out to the woods where car buyers who don't come to dealerships hang out, he goes by a roadside place. He's eaten at many times. Well, by the way, they have a bar, but that's nothing to worry about because I don't pick up no matter what. <laughs> and he went into the bar and he ordered a sandwich and a glass of milk. And suddenly the thought crossed his mind that a shot of whiskey could not hurt him on a full stomach. So he ordered another sandwich and another glass of milk and did the shot of whiskey. And the experiment went so well, <laughs> he had another. And then another. And then they said another trip to the asylum for Jim. So I call your attention to two things. After the first few experiments, the sandwich and the milk went away. <laughs> In case you were drinkers, you would know there would be no need for sandwich and milk after a minute. Um, anyway, so that's Jim, if you can relate to him. Any of you get with him? Yeah. All right, so it says if he's alcoholic, he'll understand you at once. Right. He'll match your, own, your mental inconsistencies with some of his own. If you're satisfied that he's a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. So we don't use that word lightly. They've defined for us the real alcoholic. When did they define that? Back in There's a Solution, pages 20, 21, they talked about the moderate drinker. He can give it up easily if he has good reason. The hard drinker who can give it up if he has sufficient reason. Yeah, but he may, yeah, you, you want to review? Better review. Okay. I, I, look, we're getting you... We're getting you set to take this power out for a walk, so we want you properly armed so you can go fishing. So we're going to go to 20, and let's just, moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely. If they have good reason for it, they can take it or leave it alone. Is that you? You can take it or leave it alone? All right, so moderate is not us. Now we're going to get into some more, more complex deep dive. Okay, um, then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He, can, he may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally. It may cause him to die a few years before his time. If a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warning of a doctor becomes operative, this man can also stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. When he goes for that medical attention, where is he going to go? He's going to end up in the same detox and residential treatment as me. But he can stop. Any of you go to more than one residential treatment? Did any of you have the discovery that I had that I am not the hard drinker? Because I had sufficient reason. But I could not give it away. Couldn't give it away. But that guy's going to tell a very different story than me, and sometimes I'm going to want to hear his story because it sounds better. Does it make sense? Yeah. Now they're going to talk to me, perhaps you. But what about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker. Any of you start off as a moderate drinker? Okay. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. So the first symptom is a loss of control while drinking. That's what many people come to notice first. Any of you notice that? Yes. Okay. 
So now they're going to talk to us, take a deep dive. Here's the fellow who's been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. So how many of you had times where you could somewhat control it? Right? In, in the chapter 3, they said the idea that he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every alcoholic. How many of you found at times you could control it, but you did not enjoy it? So that obsession keeps us in it long before, long after we've realized that we've lost control, yes? Okay. Then it goes on to say, he does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. Any of you think of any? Yeah. That's how you got here in a roundabout way. Okay. He's a, doc, a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. How many of you have experienced a little personality change? He's seldom mildly intoxicated. He's always more or less insanely drunk. So how, where's my drinkers? Are there drinkers in here? So when you are insanely drunk, could people watching you know how insanely drunk you were? Sometimes. But we would go to the detox, and they'd do a blood alcohol on us, and they'd go, dude! You should be hospitalized. Yeah. Hence my arrival. Yeah. Like, could, we could pull it off because insane, it was insane, but it was also, right? Okay. So his disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. He may be one of the finest fellows in the world. You let him drink for a day, and he frequently becomes disgustingly and even dangerously antisocial. So how many of you had some clean time, picked up again, and can relate to disgustingly antisocial? Like quick. Okay. So that's kind of a rough idea of the real alcoholic. So now we're back to, to the 12th step. If you're satisfied that he's a real alcoholic, so I've shared these facts with him. He's related to me with these facts, and now... Sounds like Cat might need a program and not just a fellowship. Because he's going to need power, and it better be in him. Right? Okay. All right, so begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. So what is the hopeless feature of the malady? Once he starts to drink, he won't be able to stop. And once I stop, I can't stay stopped. For some silly reason. Yeah? And the reaction's never going to change. Show him from your own experience how the queer mental condition surrounding that first drink performs, prevents normal functioning of the willpower. So this is why I don't pick up no matter what is such a false tale for those of us that are real alcoholics, and it may be true for the hard drinker, is the insanity happens before the drink, not after. And we miss that. The insanity of addiction is the fact that self-knowledge will not stop me because at a certain point I will not be able to bring to consciousness with sufficient force the memory of suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. And I'll be without defense because whatever I'm going through now is too bad to worry about what it once was like. Okay. So don't at this stage refer to this book unless he's seen it and wishes to discuss it and be careful not to brand him as an alcoholic. Why? <laughs> well, and, and quite frankly, they're not an alcoholic till they're redeemed. We've screwed that up in the fellowship for years. These guys are very clear. When we were crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not po postpone or evade. We had to f fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or he's nothing. What's your choice to be? When we became alcoholic. So until I have moved into redemption, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm a hard drinker, dry at the moment, I'm, I'm whatever, but I'm, I'm not an alcoholic in a meaningful way. How many of you used an excuse for what you were about to do? I'm a drug addict, what else, you, what do you expect? <laughs> so clearly we weren't really informed about the gravity of that, yes? So it means nothing to say that. This is a witness to a hopeless state, a dead man bearing witness to you of the life in me. Yes? Okay. All right, so let him draw his own conclusion. If he sticks to the idea he can still control his drinking, tell him possibly he can if he's not too alcoholic. 
So get honest with yourself. How many want to be told you're not addict enough? <laughs> yes, I am. None of us want to be told we're not alcoholic enough. I always used to tease guys that came in about this time of year. Huh, weren't tough enough to make it through Christmas, huh? <laughs> you're probably not a real alcoholic. That pisses them off. Anyway. So, but insists that if he's severely afflicted, there may be little chance he can recover by himself. We're really not throwing him under the bus. I need them to convince me they need help. Because they're not convincing me, they're talking to him, and he's going to make himself known to them when they honestly show him that gift of desperation he's placed in them. Okay. So continue to speak of alcoholism as an illness, a fatal malady. Talk about the conditions of body and mind which accompany it. What are the conditions of body and mind? The condition of body is that when I put it in my body, I experience an abnormal reaction. The doctor said it may be an allergy, but what it really means to a guy like me is alcohol energizes me. So do opiate drugs. My methamphetamine friends, they get calmed down by that shit. That's weird. <laughs> Keep his attention focused mainly on your personal experience. Explain that many are doomed to never realize their predicament. So we're just trying to get you to relate to my experience, not trying to tell you what yours is. Does that make sense? Doctors are rightly loath to tell alcoholic patients the whole story unless it will serve some good purpose. But you may talk to him about the hopelessness of alcoholism because you offer a solution. So we have that dubious luxury of talking straight to people because we offer a solution. Do you guys know what solution we offer? Yeah, initially it's the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and ultimately it's the power that we discover within us through the process of Alcoholics Anonymous. Yep, okay. So you will soon have your friend admitting he has many, if not all the traits of the alcoholic. If his own doctor is willing to tell him that he's alcoholic, so much the better even though your protege may not have entirely admitted his condition, he's become very curious to know how you got well. Let him ask you that question if he will. So they, they're emphatic that you wait, you lead him up, and then let him ask you. And then they say in italics, tell him exactly what happened to you. Because that's the part of my story that I've been armed with. I told you what I was like. I was a dead man walking. I was full of guilt, shame, and remorse. I, I could not get out of my own way, and all I wanted for it to do is end. I just wanted to be dead, and I couldn't pick the day. And then one day this power came into me, and I was never the same again. Pow! I was a different guy. Some of you felt that, right? That's the power we call God. That didn't come from up here. That happened in you. That's recognition of this power within us. Does it make sense? Yeah. That's what happened. And what I'm like now is self-evident. 17 years later, 16 years later, whatever it is, I'm still trying to serve. Not because I want attention, but because God compels me to tell you about him. Yeah. In this format. Okay, um, so then it goes on to say if a man be atheist or, or agnostic or, or stress the spiritual feature freely, if the man be ag agnostic or atheist, make it emphatic that he does not have to agree with your conception of God. Why not? God's not a conception. If anything, I'm a conception. But God's a reality. Yes? Okay. And so you don't have to agree because none of us can fully define or comprehend that power which is God, but you can experience it, you can grow in consciousness of it, awareness of being aware, and when you walk in power, you'll know. And so will anyone you encounter. Yes? Okay. So he can choose any conception he likes, provided it makes sense to him. The main thing is that he be willing to believe in a power greater than himself and that he live by spiritual principles. Now, we're not asking them to make it up, and we point to the power that we're talking about, because they'll feel the power. They may not have ever had it called to their attention. The spiritual principles are contained in the 12 steps. They're not a long list written 15 years later. They're in here. Watch, ask, discuss, turn, pray, meditate, pray, pause when agitated, or doubtful, pray, meditate, pray. But you're going to have to learn the practices before you get into the disciplines. 
Does it make sense? Okay. When dealing with such a person, you'd better use everyday language to describe spiritual principles. See how we did that? There's no use in arousing any prejudice he may have against certain theological terms and conceptions about which he may already be confused. So how many of you have had some religious prejudice? Where's my religious people that have 12-step prejudice? I know you're in here. Okay, we're talking about the same power in different languages, and we need to stop it because we need everyone to come bear witness to this power and don't let language get in the way. This is the language of the heart we speak. So it says, don't raise such issues no matter what your own convictions are. Your prospect may belong to a religious denomination. His religious education and training may be far superior to yours. In that case, he's going to wonder how you can add anything to what he already knows. Have you ever worked with somebody, you guys that have sponsored, worked with somebody that was further advanced in religious study? So we're not here to teach religion. We're, We're simply here to show them the practical application of what religion instructs. We don't have to work hard to please God. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. Um, But he'll be curious to learn why his own convictions have not worked and why yours seem to work so well. He may be an example of the truth that faith alone is insufficient. To be vital, Faith must be accompanied by self-sacrifice and unselfish constructive action. Faith without works is dead. Okay? So we're going to jump over from there to page 94. And they say, outline the program of action explaining how you made a self-appraisal. How would I do that? Explain to them how I did it. First step would be for me to make a self-appraisal. Therefore, I could then explain how I made a self-appraisal, and the self-appraisal is the first step of action we take in the 12-step program program of recovery. Yes? Why do we do a self-appraisal? So we can understand who and what we are. Who we are and whose we are, right? Convinced that self manifested in various ways what had defeated me, we considered its common manifestations. How am I going to know what I was like, what happened, what I'm like now if I don't go through that process and get properly armed? Right? Okay. So it's important for him to realize that you're, how you straightened out your past and why you're now endeavoring to be helpful to him. I'm sorry, why am I endeavoring to be helpful to him? Because he's a foundation stone in my recovery, right? I need a little stone in my foundation. Okay. Um, It's important for him to realize that your attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital role in your own recovery. Notice that they said your attempt. See, I'm always doing my 12 step, not yours. I'm always seeking a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps for me, not you. That's above my pay grade. You and the power I introduce you to are going to be in charge of yours. So I'm going to attempt to pass this on to you, and I ain't going to be mad if you don't take it. I had a buddy one time said, you just sponsor like the mailman. You just deliver the mail. Don't wait for him to read it. Okay. Actually, he may be helping you more than you're helping him. Make it plain that he's under no obligation to you, that you hope only that he will try and help other alcoholics when he escapes his own difficulties. Why do I hope he'll do that? Because it'll be growth for him. Yeah, you'll never unpack if you don't. Do you guys realize that? The 12th step is nothing more than an awakened amends. I'm amending, I'm, I'm participating in God's plan to take everything that happened to me and turn it into something purposeful for God. And the only way that's going to happen is to participate in that plan, which means I'm going to carry this message to others. And if I don't do that, I will never unpack. The fourth step didn't unpack me. The fifth step didn't unpack me. Even the amends didn't do it. I didn't even know what my old ideas were until I had to go out and help people I thought I didn't like. Had never met them, but they looked like people I didn't like. (laughs) Any of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Suggest how important it is that he place the welfare of other people ahead of his own. Make it clear that he's not under pressure, that he needn't see you again if he doesn't want to. And you should not be offended if he wants to call it off, for he's helped you more than you've helped him. Why did they put that in there? How many of you have worked with somebody? Spent hours with them. Hey, dude, check it out. I'm going to get someone else to work with me. You know, 
Hope it works out, you son of a bitch. You couldn't have, <laughs> you could, couldn't have told me that before you wasted eight hours of my life. May not say it, but we think it, don't we? But what did he show me? He showed me my attachments, and my attachments are suffering. I'm not attached to his result. I'm responsible for delivery. That's it. So if your talk has been sane, quiet, full of human understanding, you've perhaps made a friend. Maybe you've disturbed him about the question of alcoholism. How many of you had someone disturb you about addiction before you sought help for your addiction? So there's all kinds of seasons of coming into awareness of something needing to be done, isn't there? Okay. This is all to the good. The more hopeless he feels, the better he'll be more likely to follow your suggestion. Your candidate may give reasons why he need not follow all the programs. You guys ever encountered one of those? Were you one of those? Okay. He may rebel at the thought of a drastic house cleaning which requires discussion with other people. You ever heard that? I don't mind looking at my stuff, but I'm not telling that to anyone. Okay. You shouldn't then. But what is what's happening when I won't uncover something? It's blocking consciousness of this power. The power is power, peace, happiness, sense of direction. So as long as I hold on to that, I'm not going to use it for purpose. The minute I use it for purpose, it's been repurposed. It's no longer suffering. It's no longer some gnarly thing I did. It, it's been put to purpose. Does it make sense? Yeah. That's the house cleaning. Um, so it says, do not contradict such views. Tell him you once felt as he does, but you doubt whether you would have made much progress had you not taken action. I would suggest to you, if you're new at this, surround yourself with people who do this, because the people who do this always have people around them who do this, because we drive each other through our steps and our disciplines. On your first visit, tell him about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Notice how they were careful to, dim to differentiate between fellowship and program. We don't do that anymore. We tell them, you're in the program if you sit your ass in a chair. You're no more than you're a duck if you sit your ass in a pond. <laughs> if he shows interest, lend him a copy of your book. Unless your friend wants to talk further about himself, do not wear out your welcome. Give him a chance to think it over. If you do stay, let him steer the conversation in any direction he likes. Sometimes a new man is anxious to proceed at once, and you may be tempted to let him do so. Have you ever had that happen? They wanted to move faster than they really were moving? Okay. This is sometimes a mistake. If he has trouble later, he's likely to say you rushed him. You'll be most successful with alcoholics if you do not exhibit any passion or cru for crusader reform. So again, it's always about, look, I once thought and felt as you did. I, I don't think I'd have made much progress had I not taken action. This is the action I took. This is what I experienced as a result. Either way, save my number. Call me if you want. I'll see you again. Why, what difference does it make? I can't compete with that, right? Okay. All right, so show them how they worked with you. Show them how they worked with me. How would I show them? I'm no longer addicted to control. His actions do not affect me. See, we don't treat alcohol addiction, methamphetamine addiction, cocaine addiction. That's, that's a symptom. We're treating our control addiction as humans. And the only substance in the known universe powerful enough to overcome, overcome a control addiction is a substance called faith. That's what we're trying to demonstrate. Okay? So offer him friendship and fellowship and tell him that if he wants to get well, you'll do anything to help. If he's not interested in your solution, if he expects you to only act as a banker for his financial difficulties or a nurse for his sprees, you may have to drop him until he changes his mind. This he may do after he gets hurt some more. So we're not here to take away from them the experience they desperately need in order to come into their awakening. Yes? So you're going to have to learn that yes means yes, and no is a complete sentence. <laughs> Everything after no is a lie. That's me giving an excuse for why I said no, but no means no. 
Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. And, and let these people have the dignity of the truth from you because you are now a representative of the truth. Okay? So I'm going to jump from there over to page 96. And they're going to give us another warning. Do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. How many of you have discovered that even though you're on fire, somehow not everybody just gets right lit up with you? Search out another alcoholic and try again. You're sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. So they're giving you a little clue as you do this more. As your eagerness diminishes and you just start bearing witness, you'll notice the ones who are eager. And those are the ones you're going to kind of help along. And the ones that are less eager, you let them do what they're going to do. They'll make it back when it's time or God will send them to someone else. You ever been that guy that called your sponsor and said, I've been working on a guy who just wasted my time. Wow, you're giving them a lot of power. Yeah. How can they waste your time when you went there to get your spiritual awakening? What was the spiritual lesson you learned? Yeah. Did you learn you weren't the power? Because yeah. it's a good idea to wake up and find out you ain't God. <laughs> there is a power. They call him God and it ain't me. <laughs> Although he operates through me. Okay, if you leave such a person alone, he may soon become convinced that he cannot recover by himself. To spend too much time on any one situation is to deny some other alcoholic an opportunity to live and be happy. Now they're going to tell us a little bit about our friend Bill Wilson. And you can see the mag... mag, I can't even say the word I was going to say. You can see how big a mistake it can be to chase. Okay? One of our fellowship faked entirely with his... Failed... Faked... Failed entirely with his first half dozen prospects... He often says if he'd continued to work on them, he might have deprived many others who have since recovered of their chance. So they're talking about Bill Wilson. He was discouraged because he'd been working with guys. They weren't getting well. Then he went, met up with Dr. Bob. He worked with Dr. Bob. All of us sitting here and all the millions of people around the world that have recovered since would have been cheated of that chance if he would just stayed out there in the alley talking to the six he first met. So that it's, uh, it's profound why when God says move, move. It's not cruel. It's just not our thing, right? Okay, suppose you're now making your second visit to the man. He's read this volume and says he's prepared to go through with the 12 steps of the program of recovery. Having had the experience yourself, you can give him much practical advice. Now they're talking to you about what what we do to show others precisely how we recovered is the main purpose of the book. I, I lay the book down because this isn't my testimony. It's not your testimony. It's their testimony. Half of them were atheists or agnostics, but they, were, they came to believe, right, to a person. That's the whole story. It's the power of testimony. Let him know you're available if he wishes to make a decision and tell his story. Do not insist upon it if he prefers to consult someone else. Okay, so now what i got to do is jump over to page 98. Last week we talked about it was time to grow in understanding and effectiveness. Remember that, those of you who are here? I said understanding of what, effectiveness at what, and we sort of thought about it. And, well, here's the answer. So it says, it's not the matter of giving that's in question, but when and how to give. So we give to everyone who asks of us, but not necessarily what they ask. I mean, I, they may ask for money, and what they need is prayer. Does it make sense? Okay. That often makes the difference between failure and success. The minute we put our work on a service plane, the alcoholic commences to rely upon our assistance rather than upon God. He clamors for this or that, claiming he cannot master alcohol until his material needs are cared for. Nonsense. Why did they say that? How many of you got out of your addiction when your material needs were not cared for? In fact, in fact, it wasn't until all my material needs were not being cared for that I was willing to consider an alternative. So they're going to talk to you about me, perhaps you. Some of us have taken very hard knocks to learn this truth. Job or no job, wife or no wife, we simply do not stop drinking so long as we place dependence upon other people ahead of our dependence upon God. Power. Power. Absolutely right, Mike. You guys get that? 
we try and keep everyone focused because we got a blend of new people and people that are in this a while. But when we say God in 12-step recovery, what you want to say is power because they are interchangeable. We come to believe in power. Yes? Got it. So then they're going to tell us, burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get, regard, he can get well regardless of anyone. How does someone burn an idea into your consciousness? That's, they're talking to you about the message that can reach these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In order to burn into your consciousness, you not only hear me, you feel me. And you ain't feeling me, you're feeling him. Because it's happening in you. It's a recognition of truth when I can't understand truth. Remember, alcoholism addiction is insanity, guys. We can't receive truth or process truth in our insanity. But we can feel it, and all of a sudden, that guy knows something I need to know. And eventually, it's that guy knows someone I need to know. The only condition is that he trusts in God and clean house, right? Okay, so I'm going to jump from there. Well, let's see what I should do. I, I, I might have done something silly. Yeah, okay, I'm going to go to page 100. Both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. So they're talking to you about a deep spiritual truth that by this stage of your awakening, you realize there's you and then there's the one in you. You understand what I'm saying? How many of you have found that you have the power to be kinder than you feel like being? How many of you have found that although you seem to have access to that power, you still think oftentimes like you? So we must... That's what the prayer and meditation does, is it allows me to grow consciously in this relationship between the way I am and the power in me. And the righteousness that I'm able to exhibit is him, and the way I think, the salt that allows me to still be human, is still me. So when you say, Joe, will you help me? And I'm thinking, this lame son of a bitch. (laughs) But the power in me says, Absolutely. What can I do to help? It's not being fake. I'm allowing him to take over his possession. Because he bought me at a price. Whether these are things I know, I'm not trying to persuade you. Um, If you persist, remarkable things will happen. How many of you have had some remarkable things happen? How many of you look around you here every day and see remarkable things happening? It, 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 it's awe-inspiring to me to see what you people do here every day. Amazing. So how many of you come from a tradition where we, we know that signs and wonders follow us? You don't have to tell anyone about that around here, do you? When we look back, we realize that things that came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. How many of you have come to that conclusion? Like, whoever thought that this is what we were going to do? I know. Let's put 400 ex-offenders in one place in the middle of town. All at one time. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> How many of you walk around here every day and you, you do feel a new freedom? Oh, yeah. 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 Guarantee you that's, that's a far bigger plan and a far bigger delivery than any human that's involved. God does not need any of us for this, but he allows us to see it every day. Um, Follow the dictates of a higher power and you'll presently live in a new and wonderful world no matter what your present circumstances. I can't tell you exactly what that looks like for you, but I came up out of homelessness. And so what happens when you come out of homelessness is your circumstance does not change very rapidly. And from the moment I encountered this power, I knew I was made new and I knew I was different and my circumstances didn't change for years. 
And I served and I served and I served because I presently lived in a new and wonderful world regardless of my present circumstance. I'm telling you for a fact that's what happened. Um, I'm going to jump from there to, let's see. I think what I want to do, uh, the bottom of that page, assuming we're spiritually fit, we can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do. People have said we must not go where liquor is served, we must not have it in our homes, we must shun friends who drink, we must avoid moving pictures which show drinking scenes, we must not go into bars, our friends must hide their bottles if we go to their houses, we mustn't think or be reminded about alcohol at all. Have you ever kind of got that? Some of us in treatment models, they still do that to us to a certain extent. You know, avoid your triggers. The last, I don't know how many treatment centers I went through, guys. But the last one, they made me write a trigger list. You guys ever had to write a trigger list? I just wrote pulse. <laughs> I'm absolutely triggered by life. I'm going to have to be delivered from trigger. Our experience shows that you need, this is not necessarily show. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm not trying to make fun of treatment models. Again, remember, there's all kinds of success. I'm just trying to tell you, if you're the guy like I'm the guy, you may need to dig deep into God. Okay. Um, we meet these conditions every day. An alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. If you cannot meet the conditions of your everyday life without constantly obsessing about drugs, you need for us to help you. You will not win that battle. Don't believe that bullshit. Hang in there. You got this. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. Ask somebody who's known by this power, and we will gladly share. In fact, we're obligated to. An alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. There's something the matter with his spiritual status. His only chance for sobriety would be someplace like the Greenland ice cap. And even there, an Eskimo might turn up with a bottle of scotch and ruin everything. How many of you prayed for an Eskimo? <laughs> Ask any woman who sent her husband to distant places on the theory he could escape the alcohol problem. In our belief, any scheme of combating alcoholism which proposes to shield the sick man from temptation is doomed to failure. Why must I awaken spiritually? Because I don't need a shield when I awaken spiritually. The fact that I woke spiritually is the shield. So it says, if, he, if the alcoholic tries to shield himself, he may succeed for a time, but he usually winds up with a bigger explosion than ever. Any of you ever had a big explosion? That's what your last sentence was about, huh? A big explosion. <laughs> So our rule is to not, not to avoid a place where there is drinking if we have a legitimate reason for being there. You're the only one who knows. You've got a legitimate reason for being somewhere where something's going on. Question yourself and see. And it says that includes bars, nightclubs, dances, receptions, weddings, even the plain ordinary whoopee parties. Now I know we don't do a lot of whoopee parties in the 21st century, but I think it's sad that we don't. Just think a whoopee party sounds like a hoot. <laughs> to a person who's had experience with an alcoholic, this may seem like tempting providence, but it isn't. You will note that we made an important qualification. Therefore, ask yourself on each occasion, have I any good social business or personal reason for going to this place? So just be honest with yourself. To your own self, be true. Just like they've always said. There's one thing... At the last of this chapter, I'd like you to, to, to know uh, on page 102, your job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum, maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing line of life with these motives and God will keep you unharmed. Take the power out for a walk, folks. Thank you very much.